starting in Barcelona, finishing in Barcelona, 14 boats are racing around the planet two-handed. Non-stop. Dee Kafari, the only woman to have circumnavigated solo non-stop in two directions, is taking part. It's a privileged position to be the first female team in the Barcelona World Race. Olympic gold medalists Ika Martinez and Xabi Fernandez have mastered the short sprint, but now they face a 25,000-mile marathon. We enjoy ourselves, which is the secret of working well together. And after winning in 2008, Jean-Pierre Dic returns to defend his title. Uh, it was fantastic for me to win the first edition of the Barcelona. They all face incredible fatigue on the anvil of the oceans, pushing their boats to the limit and beyond. But perhaps the biggest pressure is on their partnership. It really is the ultimate lesson in trusting somebody else with your boat, with your life, with your race. Just over halfway in the 25,000-mile Barcelona World Race, an epic globe-crunching contest for duos aboard 60-foot muscle machines. Two boats have been dismasted, Jean Lacam and Bruno Garcia's President, and solo legend Michel Desjoyeaux's hotly-tipped Foncia. 14 started, 12 remain. Defending champion Jean-Pierre Dic stopped twice to repair damage. And both times, incredibly, he managed to retake the lead aboard the back Paprec 3 with his charismatic co-skipper, Loic Perron. And Cook Strait in New Zealand reshuffled the pack when Estrella Dam and Group Bell stopped for 48 hours, allowing Renault, Neutrogena and Mirabeau to leap up the rankings to third, fourth and fifth. But the story that's fueled unprecedented media coverage in the second edition of this event has been the 4,000-mile drag race between French maestros Dick and Perron and the Spanish hotshots aboard Mavre, Ica Martinez and Xabi Fernandez, double Olympic medalists in the Flying 49er class. From New Zealand onwards for 12 solid days and nights, these two teams, so different in background and character, have been slugging it out, neck and neck, no quarter given, none taken. Both determined in a superhuman way to beat each other and win this marathon of sailing. To do this at full tilt in the ferocious Southern Ocean has been jaw-dropping. Now both teams are about to turn the corner at Cape Horn, a wild remote finger of rock pointing down into the path of the untrammeled storms raging around Antarctica. Cape Horn, for good reason, holds a mythical place in maritime history, but it's about to become very real for the competitors sailing around it. When you pass Cape Horn, it's an extraordinary moment in this race. After a difficult month in the Southern Ocean, finally you're heading home. 
Sí, el Cabo de Hornos es eh, un punto yes. mítico. Sí, Cape Horn es un mítico punto point geográfico. It marks the end of the Southern Ocean, which normally you're happy to leave well behind because it's quite cold. It's quite incredible, this rock which seems to appear in the middle of nowhere. Sailors aboard the 18th century clipper ships trading between Europe and Asia earned the right to wear a circular gold earring on rounding Cape Horn. Before the Panama Canal, it was an obligatory landmark littered with wrecks and smashed by storms. For the Frenchmen aboard the Back Paprec III, first to the horn, their joy is unmistakable. This is Peron's third rounding in a race. The second was during the race for Mega Multi Hulls in 2001. Hello, H. Yes. What, what's behind you? The camera. Ah, yes. oh, that's the cable. Look at that. That's a very famous rock in the world. Jean Pierre Dic is also third time around. Most recently, on his way to winning the first edition of the Barcelona World Race in 2008 with Damien Foxall. To pass first, the ocean has been difficult. You're tired, you're happy to be there. It's always magic. Ica Martinez and Xabi Fernandez arrived just four hours and 20 minutes later. Nothing in a race of 25,000 miles. We are under a cloud, and here we are on Cape Horn. We just finished the Pacific. The Olympic medalists are at a disadvantage here. While the back Paprec 3 stopped in New Zealand to make repairs, Martinez and Fernandez plowed on, fixing a damaged dagger board in a makeshift workshop on board. This lack of an overhaul hits home just after Cape Horn. The halyards which run up inside the mast to hoist sails are worn out and they have to find sheltered water to climb the mast to replace them. We're taking time to fix this because we couldn't hoist the J1, which is the biggest sail after the Solent. Well, it's moving around a bit. The Spanish duo are soon off, though, chasing the back Paprec 3 ahead. They're determined that despite setbacks, they can take the Frenchman down. Heading up the Atlantic, there are tactical options open to the teams now. Weather expert Marcel Van Triest, himself a five-time circumnavigator, briefs race management and media on the options ahead. Here for those boats. The first two boats, Mapfer and Vierbach, have opted to go around the east. I expect the St. Helena High to slowly drift east, which makes, will make it very difficult for the boats behind them to do the same. Also, it's a massive detour, as you can see. So there's an opportunity opening up here for them to actually go straight north, more variable winds, but a lot shorter route. As the front runners consider those options, Renault is third approaching Cape Horn, followed by Neutrogena, Group Bell, Mirabeau and Estrella Dam. Behind this peloton, Hugo Boss leads the women aboard Gaes Centros Auditivos, a war these two teams have been waging for weeks. With Forum Maritime Catalan a long way behind. But back in Wellington, We Are Water and Central Lechera Asturiana have both stopped to make repairs. They could be in for a long race. Pachi Rivero and Antonio Piris aboard Renault are next around Cape Horn in tougher conditions. To climb the rankings to third at this stage is a dream for Rivero, who just missed the podium last time. Well, last time we were fourth, and it was a great result. But this time it's much more difficult because there are more boats, and they're better. Our objective is to arrive in third position, to be on the podium. The peloton behind hits serious weather in the final stretch of the Southern Ocean. 
First of all, I'm dressed for the conditions. Dry top with latex seals, boots, full foul weather gear, probably 24 and a 30. Oh, that is some cold, cold water. The long-term hammering takes its toll on fifth-placed Group Bell, forcing Quito de Pavon and Seb Odigan to head for Ushuaia to investigate problems with their keel. Meanwhile, Michelle Paré, aboard Mirabeau, has been laid up in her bunk, suffering from anemia. The race director allowed extra medicine to be handed over in Cook Strait, but any illness at sea can spiral out of control quickly, so far from help. Co-skipper Dominique Wavre has been handling the boat alone. Well, Michelle has started taking vitamins to fight against losing red blood cells. She tried to keep sailing normally, but little by little, she started to feel weaker. For Wavre, one of the most experienced sailors in the fleet, and concerned for the health of his partner, this race has now become a serious handful. Firing north and battling with Estrella Dam and Neutrogena, Michelle is back on her feet. Then a cruel blow strikes Mirabeau. Their mast breaks, and the duo have to cut it away before it damages the cabin. To make matters worse, Wavre and Paré are short of fuel to motor the 650 miles to land. An Argentinian Air Force plane flies overhead to check on their safety. The fleet is rounding Cape Horn for the return leg up the Atlantic during the 25,000-mile globe-circling Barcelona World Race. A hard test for duos in powerful ocean-going yachts. Cape Horn! Yoo-hoo! Momentazo! Vamos, a mí es un subidón tremendo el, el pasar el Cabo de Hornos Terceros. Mirabeau is the third boat in the race to be dismasted. A bitter blow for the highly experienced Swiss-French couple Dominique Wavre and Michel Paré. They take on extra fuel to make land, some 650 miles away from a considerate Argentinian Navy. The dream is also over for Group Bell, whose keel is too badly damaged by rough weather in the Southern Ocean. Quito de Pavont and Seb Odigan head into Ushuaia in Argentina and sadly call it a day. 14 started, 10 now remain in one of the toughest ocean races in existence. The sailors have been at sea now for over two months and this time away from family takes its toll, particularly for those with newborn babies. When defending champion Jean-Pierre Dick started the race, his son Erwan was three months old. And far out to sea, he takes time to catch up with partner Rosen at home in Brittany. Uh, yeah, we've started to go faster again with good winds, so we're happy. That's great. And how's the little one doing? Has he grown much? Yes, he's doing well and he's sleeping well. Well, I'm sure he's completely changed. Yes, he's months older, so yes, he's got bigger. Okay. Big kiss to you. Say hello to Loic and take care of both of you. And good wins. And she follows another nautical tradition, waiting for her man to come back from the sea. Hola. Pepe Ribes is also a new father. Pepe Junior was four months old when the race started, and Pepe Senior catches up with his wife Sandra via video conference. Have you seen how big he is? He looks really great. 
He's so different to the pictures, don't you think? Hello, Pepe. He can already hold his head up. He says, my father's the best. It's a melting moment for this hard man of Spanish oceanic sailing. <laughs> Meanwhile, back to the hard business of racing. Clawing back miles in the Southern Ocean, Ribes and Peya are now challenging the American-German duo aboard New Tragina for fourth place. Their first clash in the South Atlantic takes them through fierce conditions. A little bit of water. But despite the rough ride, American Ryan Bremeyer and German Boris Herrmann are determined to fight them off. Yeah, we followed them closely. Uh, we, uh, we're pretty happy that we can, it seems that we could keep up their speed, more or less, at the moment. And um, it's, uh, the race is on, I would say. Over seven days, these boats take each other on, getting so close that they see each other on the horizon. Well, we can see them right behind us using our binoculars. That's life. Eventually, Estrella Dam pulls ahead, and Ribes and Peya reclaim another valuable position, fourth. The hammering on the boats is felt across the fleet. Further back, Hugo Boss pulls into the Falkland Islands to repair damaged sails. Brazilian coast. This morning we lifted up the main, and uh, we saw that there was uh, some delamination going on in the top very top of the main. Leaving the women aboard Gaius to overtake into sixth position. Di Cafari on Gaius Centros Auditivos is used to breaking down barriers. She became the first woman to sail single-handed non-stop around the world in both directions. First against the prevailing winds in 2006 and then with them during the brutal 2009 Vendée Globe coming sixth. Her co-skipper, Anna Corbea, is also on her way to setting records. If she makes it back to her hometown of Barcelona without stopping, she will be the first Spanish woman to race non-stop around the world. And already in this race, she is the first Spanish woman to round Cape Horn in competition. Sailing makes me feel alive. To feel the waves and salt and wind is what makes me feel alive. It makes me feel I'm living on this planet. And doing this event, going around this planet, will take this feeling to the max. And I'm really eager to live this, and above all, to complete this round the world race. Our favorite, that is cod and potato. Yay! For Corbea, though, a Catalan to her core, a three-month diet of freeze-dried food is not so appealing. Science has uh, done a lot with the freeze dried and there are uh, some good food, but I like a lot, uh, home, homemade, okay. yeah. But on board, it's not proving so bad. Esto es lo que nos alimenta, y esto es lo que nos hace felices. This makes us happy. Kafari was a teacher before turning professional sailor, and she still takes the lessons of the sea into schools back in England. Amazing because I, I thought, whoa, do you Kafari's on the webcam? Oh, let's go! Before the race start in Barcelona, many of the school children involved had the chance to meet the skippers themselves. <laughs> and to see the boats close up. For the organizers of the Barcelona World Race, this connection between the race and schools is part of the DNA of hosting this event. Mireia Cornudella runs the education program. 
The educational package for the Barcelona World Race is an interactive learning tool which allows you to follow sailing around the world. We have 150 schools who have taken part, mostly from Catalonia, but also from the rest of Spain and France. In fact, they're following via the live online video conferences and also through press, internet and TV. And also, we want to promote the respect for nature and oceans because it's something that links strongly to this race. If we don't take care of our oceans, we can hardly take care of our planet. Both things go together. Back on the track, the leading two boats, Verbac, Paprec 3 and Matfrey, face a decision about where exactly they should cross the doldrums, the windless hole on the equator. Weather expert Marcel Van Triest explains. But if you're back in Mafra, they're coming up to the, with the normal southeasterly trades, as we call them, into what they call the intertropical convergence zone, also known as the doldrums in English, right? What does it mean? Well, basically, it's an area of very light winds and very big clouds separating the northeast trades on the northern hemisphere and the southeast trades on the southern hemisphere. So you're looking at crossing fairly far west because further west it's sort of parallel and it's easier to get through. Through the doldrums, Iker Martinez and Xabi Fernandez aboard Mapfrey claw some miles back on the Frenchman aboard Verbac Paprec 3, then take a more direct route to Gibraltar to again put heavy pressure on the race leaders. The two Spanish Olympians, though, have a problem. Food. We realized that we're running out of food because the race is taking longer than we thought. Um, we've started to eat our reserve food, but we'll have enough to eat at least twice a day during the morning and afternoon. Tightening their belts, this marathon contest between the two boats grinds on. Speculation is rife as to what strategy the French Supremos will take and how the Olympians will respond. Talking to journalists back in Barcelona, they keep their cards close to their chest. We have a really important question. Which side are we going to leave the anticyclone? Jean-Pierre, you have three seconds to answer. This is really delicate, but for sure we have to pass it on one side or another. But each team has a joker they can play at this stage, ghost mode. They can opt to black out their position to competitors for 36 hours. As Verbag Paprec 3 approaches the Cape Verde latitude, this is exactly what Jean-Pierre Dick and Loïc Perron do. Martinez and Fernandez follow suit. Verbag Paprec is getting into a really complicated, windy area being in ghost mode. So we decided to do the same, to play a bit with these changing conditions. And both teams' tactics, at a defining moment in the game, will remain secret for the next 36 hours. Next time on the Barcelona World Race, the city prepares for the first boats home. The Mediterranean proves a tough final hurdle and we find out who will be the ultimate champions of this epic contest.